another episode of Search It Up with Sienna, the web series where I use IMDb to discover and talk about all different types of movies and TV shows, and how the people in front of and behind the camera not only make it all possible, but are somehow all interconnected. I talk directly with the talent about their backstories and experiences on and off set, and what they're up to today. On my last episode, we talked about the movie Soul. And the Foley artist on Soul is John Roche, who is also the Foley artist on the movie E.T. So today, we're going to be talking about E.T. And joining me is an amazing guest. Her name is Marcy Learoff, and she's a casting director on E.T. E.T. is a 1982 Steven Spielberg movie about a boy named Elliot who finds this alien in his backyard, who is left by his family from outer space. They become best friends and share everything together, literally. Everything E.T. is feeling or experiencing, Elliot does too. But because they're connected, they both get sick. Can they save them? You'll have to watch and find out if you haven't already. This movie has an amazing cast. I talk about this and more in my interview with Marcy Learoff. In addition to E.T., her credits include some of my favorite movies. A Christmas Story, Poltergeist, Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, Blade Runner, Footloose, Pretty in Pink, Freaky Friday, Mean Girls, Mr. Popper's Penguins, Magic Camp, and so many more. And now, without further ado, here's my interview with Marcy Learoff. So what first interested you in the film business? Well, I was going to college and I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I, I, I had an idea that it was in film or television or music, maybe. Like I didn't grow up with any, my parents, um, used to manufacture swimsuits, bikinis. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't grow up in the business at all. And I was just interested in it. Like I was always watching tons of television and tons of movies and I was drawn towards it. And so when I got out of school, I started working for an independent film company and I was doing foreign distribution. I was the assistant to the, the vice president of foreign. So we were selling the rights to these films to different countries all over the world. And then I went to ICM, which is a talent agency, which was one of the biggest talent agencies in the world. And I worked for a TV agent there. And through working for that guy, I discovered casting because we were trying to like sell our actors to the casting directors that cast these shows. And so that's where I learned what a casting director was because I had never even heard of that before. Yeah. And so when I left ICM, I, I was, really feeling like I should look into casting because I think I'd be good at it. And then I got this job working for this company called uh, Fenton and Feinberg, Mike Fenton and Jane Feinberg. Mm -hmm. And they cast a lot of really, really high profile movies and they were very busy. And so a lot of those jobs fell to me. Mm -hmm. And I just, I tried to make myself indispensable, meaning mm -hmm. I would try to stay two steps ahead of him and, and give him what he needed. And I was always coming up with ideas, even if for casting, even if they weren't asked for. Mm -hmm. And then I hired USC and UCLA interns to answer the phone so that I didn't have to stay in the front office. And it got me into the audition room. And that's where everything just kind of took over. Yeah. So it kind of just happened all quickly. Uh, well, it, it happened over the course of, I was there for five years oh. and they taught me a ton. It was like going to uni casting university in a way. Mm -hmm. They were very busy. And so we were doing, like I said, a lot of high pro profile films and they trained me really well and they trusted me. And so I was able to work with them and cast a lot of these, these movies. Wow. And I watched Henry Thomas's audition and it was amazing to see how connected he was, especially with improv. Did you know he would be offered the job on the spot? No, no, <laughs> not at all. Um, I think you really, um, you really hit on something really important is that because I show, I teach acting also and I coach actors and I show them that clip to say, look how connected he is. So what yeah. you just said is really important from the moment he starts, he's in it and then it makes the audience you know, root for him. Yeah. So um, the story is, is that he, uh, we had chosen someone else. We were, weren't really sure of whether he was going to work out. We hadn't offered him the part, but we had an idea of who would play the friends and who would play uh, the, the brother of Henry Thomas's role. And so we thought we'd get them together to see what 
their chemistry was like. Sometimes we do, it's called a chemistry read. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we actually do an audition with actual scenes. And sometimes we just have them hang out and see what they're like together. So we invited all the, the boys that we liked for the friends and the brother and the kid that we liked for the role of Elliot over to the writer's house. And we had them play Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. and watch them interact with each other mm -hmm. and then in a few minutes it became really clear that nobody really liked this little boy they mm -hmm. just weren't really getting along so we realized this is not our boy so I had to start over and then at the same time this director named Jack Fisk called Steven Spielberg and said I just work with this I heard you're looking for a little boy I just work with this amazing little boy in this film that I directed and you should read him and so Henry Thomas was living on a little farm in Texas in a small little town. Yeah. And so we flew him and his mom out to Hollywood. Oh, wow. And um, he'd been up since like three in the morning to catch all these planes and he was exhausted. And so we had him read a scene. Um, we don't really ever give out the script, but we had him read a scene that we had kind of made up. And he was okay, he wasn't great. And so Stephen came up with this idea of doing an improvisation and the improv was that um, a guy from NASA was come, heard that this boy was keeping this creature in his house and NASA needed to study this creature. And your job, Henry, is to do everything you can not to let him take the creature. Yeah. So, and that's what he did. And he, you know, no one told him to cry. No one took, gave him any guidance, but he was just using, all, I think, all of his anxiety to fuel him through the scene. Yeah. And so all of us in the room behind the camera are literally like weeping, we're crying. And finally, Stephen starts poking my boss who was doing the scene with him. And he says, tell him he can keep him, tell him he can keep him. Cause we were like, <gasps> and so then he changed it around and said, okay, well, we're gonna let you keep him. And then Stephen says out of nowhere, okay, you got the job kit. And we all just like laughed and cried. And this is very exciting. Very, yeah. very exciting. It was one of the best, if not the best audition I've ever been in. Uh -huh. If you if you wait to the end, you can hear laughing and that's me <laughs> laughing. Yeah. But he, he, I don't think I'll ever see anything as honest and as, as moving as that. Yeah. And like you said earlier, and I also watched an interview and I heard you said that you had them play D Dungeons and Dragons together. Have you ever had anything else like with movies you cast like that? And you've had people play games or do activities together? Um, when we were doing Raiders and Indiana Jones, mm -hmm. instead of having people re uh, read together or audition, because again, we weren't giving out the script. The reason why we don't do that is because we're scared somebody's going to take the idea and rip it yeah. off. Uh -huh. and get it made before we get our movie out there. So um, I remember specifically on Indiana Jones, we had this really cool office and it had a beautiful kitchen. It's really wide open kitchen. And so I would put people together as a couple and then they would come in and uh, cook together. Oh, wow. And so we were just watching the dynamic of what it would be like with their interaction of cooking together and see, you know, some people would really connect and some people you know weren't interacting and so it was a really great great way to see what they'd be like together wow that's a really cool way to kind of see how people yeah are and then ultimately when we narrowed it down we had them do real screen tests yeah and back in the day a screen test meant um they would build a set and they would have hair and makeup and costumes and props nowadays we just shoot it on it's very and it was very expensive yeah. nowadays we just shoot it on video in our office you know it's not such a big deal but then once we narrowed it down then we started like putting couples together and mixing and matching them to see who would be right for um for indiana jones and who would be right for marion and then on the next movie we mixed and matched with harrison uh -huh. and what was the most challenging role to cast in et I would say that role, uh, the a role of Elliot, hmm. because he's got the whole movie on his shoulders. You know, the whole movie is like a big close up of him. And you've got to have a kid. It, casting kids is, is tricky because a lot of times their parents coach them too much and they come in like these little kid robots and they, they're not really kids. I want them to be a kid, you know, authentic in a real 
kid. And, and sometimes I have to undo all the stuff that their teachers have taught them or, or that they, their parents have told them is the right thing. And I want them to just, you know, be regular kids. Yeah. So I think that was a, that was a difficult role to cast. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about your experience working with Steven Spielberg? Sure. Um, I was lucky enough to work with him on several films. Mm -hmm. um, Raiders, uh, Indiana Jones, and the Temple of Doom, uh, E.T., Poltergeist he produced, and The Twilight Zone. So uh, he's just one of the most creative people I've ever met. He, he would come up with an idea, like a new idea every six seconds. <laughs> he, he was just terrifically creative and also, uh, I wanna say childlike, in the way that he really um, he had a great imagination, yeah. and um, and he would talk to kids not like they were kids. He would just relate to them as one human to another human, and he would always get the best out of them. And the same with adults. You know, he just has this really large sense of wonder and imagination and creativity. So many of the movies he worked on are still popular today. And I actually just like recently watched a lot of them, like for my first time. Like I watched. Um, Mean Girls, recent like just recently for the first time, the Freaky Friday, Pretty in Pink, uh, wow, Fitness, and a little bit of Indiana Jones, and I love them all. And I was like, kept telling my mom, like, I want to like do so many questions, like I want to do ET. Obviously, I'm doing right now, and I love that movie too. But like, there's so many, all the others, I loved so much too. But they're all still popular today. Why do you think they appeal to so many generations still? Uh, well, I think a lot of these movies, I was just going to ask you, like, how did they hold up? Meaning a lot of them were done many years ago. Yeah. And um, sometimes when you watch them now, they don't hold up because they were very um, specific to that time period. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just not cool anymore. But I think all those movies are, um, they're like internationally uh, likable by, by yeah. people in many different uh, countries, because I think they all deal with uh, human interaction. Yeah. And, and um, love. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think we can all relate to those things. And, and things like Mean Girls and Freaky Friday, like not fitting in, I think we could, we, like we all can really relate to those things. Yeah. And so they're, they're human themes that, that keep recurring decade after decade. Yeah, definitely. Especially like Mean Girls. I forget when it was made. To, I feel like I looked and then I forgot. I think it was like 17 or 18 years ago. Yeah, like I, all my like all my friends like still are like they talk about it all the time. Like not even just the Broadway show, which is a little bit newer, but like even the movie itself, they still talk about. Yeah, and, and there's lots of you know Tina Fey wrote that script, mm -hmm. and she's really smart and really funny, and so a lot of the uh, it was based on a book but she adapted it into a screenplay. And then a lot of the um, sayings that she had are, you know, we still use today. Yeah. You know, like, uh, you know, he doesn't even go here and, and like, it's so fetch. <laughs> you know, those things she made up and, but we still use them. They're like great catchphrases. Yeah. Um, and can you talk a little bit about how your work was on those movies too? Like Freaky Friday, Mean Girls, Pretty in Pink? Um, well, Freaky Friday and Mean Girls were directed by the same guy. His name is Mark Waters, and I've done about seven or eight films with him, um, including I started with Freaky Friday and Mean Girls. Um, did you see the Spiderwick Chronicles? I think you would like that. I actually haven't. It's based on a series of books, and it's really a really cool movie. Um, and so I love working with him because he's great with actors. A lot of directors don't know how to talk to actors. Yeah. They're, they know exactly where to put the camera. Their, their mind is, is very technical, but they don't know how to get stuff out of actors. And he is married to an actress. And so he gets it. And he, he studied acting in, in college. And he, um, he's also very creative and can make a decision because some directors have a hard time making a decision. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was just really fun putting the group together. Um, Freaky Friday was an interesting experience in that it originally starred Annette Benning as the lead role, not Jamie Lee Curtis. And uh, 
in the midst of it, we were doing rewrites of the script and Annette Benning got another movie with Kevin Costner and she asked if we can push back for about six or eight weeks. So we pushed back. I still kept casting, still kept, um, they still kept rewriting. And then when, when she got done with the film, we still weren't done rewriting. And she said, I can't really go into rehearsal if we don't have a full script. And so she pulled out. And this is two weeks before we started shooting. Uh. And so because she pulled out, it, it caused this train wreck. So we were supposed to have Tom Selleck play her uh, fiance. So he pulled out because she pulled out. Yeah. Um, Gary Marshall was supposed to play her dad. And then he was directing a film and the dates changed and it conflicted. So he pulled out. Um, Chad Michael Murray started to pull out because all these other people were pulling out. Uh, Kelly Osborne from the Osbournes was also in the, in the cast. She pulled out because she had a lot of things going in her personal life. Yeah. So two weeks before it starts shooting, I have to recast like three or four roles. Wow. <laughs> and I've been casting this movie for like six months now. <laughs> oh so. Uh, the head of the studio came up with this idea of Jamie Lee Curtis uh, because she saw her on the cover of a magazine called Self Magazine. And it was a, a picture of her before hair and makeup and then in, a, in her underwear and then a picture of her like on the cover of the magazine in full hair and makeup. And she just thought she was like so bold and so um, comfortable in her own skin. Yeah. And so she took over the role and just like gangbusters, just kind of brought everybody together and jumped into it in this really fearless way. And now I can't imagine anybody else doing that role. Yeah, definitely. She's, de she's definitely really good for it too. And I love, and I love Jamie Lee Curtis too, because I remember I love the movie, My Girl. And I actually interviewed it. I interviewed the writer from it before and I it for this. And she, it's just such a good movie and she fits into that role really well too. Yeah, she's a really good actor. I like her a lot. Mm -hmm. And do you approach the casting process differently now versus the 1980s or 90s? That's a really good question. It's changed a lot because when I first started, we didn't even have uh, a video camera. So we would just do the readings, the auditions. It would be me in the room with the director and maybe the producer. And we would narrow things down and we would tell the studio who we wanted. And there was no, you know, there was no videotape for all yeah. these people to look at. <laughs> um, and the internet didn't exist then. And so uh, agents would literally show up at my office to get a copy of a script. They would sit in my office and read it. They would bring a book that had all pictures of their clients. And they would, they would pitch to me, meaning they would like say, this person's right for it. This person's right for it. At my desk, across the desk from me, going through their book with all their pictures. Now everything's electronic. It moves at the speed of lightning. And, you know, there's good things about it. And then there's bad things about it because things move so quickly. People expect you to have things done a lot quicker. But we're so busy with the fact that anybody can reach me from all over the world. And so there's a lot of content that I have to look through, like a lot, a lot of auditions. So, you know, it's good and it's bad. Also, now there's so many cooks in the kitchen, meaning there's so many people involved in making this decision where it used to be just a few of us. So it's changed a lot. Yeah, I definitely, especially having no video camera, that's just like, how like they don't even get to have like a second take or anything. Uh, yeah, exactly. But but we do get to like work with them in the room and we give them a lot of chances to, you know, to do a second audition. Yeah. And then if it's a really big movie, we'll do a screen test. Like I worked on Blade Runner. And so that you probably haven't seen that, but you know, we did full on film screen tests for that. Oh. Footloose, same thing. Oh. Did you see Footloose? I, I saw it half of it but yes okay. I think I've seen most I think I saw only you gotta see the original one because that's the one I, I worked on because there's a remake of it but you gotta see yeah, the, original the original one with Kevin Bacon yeah yeah yeah. That. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that one was really good I love dancing too so oh yeah that's cool that's so that's a true story that there was this town I think it was Texas I'm not sure where they they wouldn't allow dancing Oh, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, because they thought it kind of like got people too sexually uh, excited. Mm -hmm. 
That's really weird. <laughs> you said that you need to feed, I watched an interview of you again, and you said that you need to feed your soul to be creative. What keeps you motivated to do this? Well, I think uh, we get so caught up in our work and often it takes over, meaning you're just doing it or thinking about it 24 hours a day. And also because of the internet and things like cell phones, you're now reachable 24 hours a day. Yeah. And it used to be that we had like work hours, you know, nine to five. That has been obliterated. And so um, you have to be really strong in, in creating some boundaries so that you, you can balance your life with your real life and then your work life. And sometimes you have to unplug and say no and, and you know, go and be with your family or, you know, get out and, and hear music or go to a concert or a play uh, walk with your dogs, be with your kids. So that balance is really important in order to foster creativity. Mm -hmm. I think if you don't interact with life, then you're just going to be like a very hollow shell of a person because you're not having any real life experiences. Yeah, I love dogs and I love to play with my dog a lot too. Yeah, I find that, the, that uh, weirdly enough, I'm most creative when I'm walking my dog like thoughts will just come to me or in the shower <laughs> <laughs> or in the bath, like water has something to do with it where it just like creative ideas come to me in those situations. Yeah, I can see that. I, I always uh, feel like I just think more when I'm in the shower or something Yeah. Or, or actually even more if I'm in a relaxing bath, but yeah, exactly. Um, what advice would you give to young talent looking to pursue a career in front of or behind the camera? Well, I think for an actor, if a kid wants to be an actor, I think um, they have to really understand that there's a ton of disappointment. Mm -hmm. It's not, you don't just always get the job. You're, you're up against thousands of other kids. And so you really have to want to do it. It has to, like, I ask kids all the time when I meet them, why do you want to be an actor? Why are you doing this? And if they say something like, well, we were at a mall and this lady saw me and she talked to my mom and she told me that I should get my pictures taken and maybe I should, you know, go up and try it. That's not someone that's going to succeed. The kid that's going to succeed is the one that comes to their mom or their dad and says, I really want to do this. And, and they're in school plays and they keep asking and keep asking and, and they, they get into it and they're doing it because it feeds them. You know, a lot of actors, I say, why do you want to do this? Or why are you doing this? And they said, I can't think of anything else to do. This is, this is my life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's a, there, there's really not many other jobs where you would go to interview for the job and have 20 people there sitting in the waiting room that are kind of like you. Yeah. And you're all vying for the same job. So you got to really, really want it. And then in terms of working behind the, the scene, behind the camera, um, it's a really good idea to get a job as a production assistant. It's a great job for you to see all the different departments and learn maybe what you might want to do because you come to work one day and they'll say, okay, today you're going to be working in the wardrobe department. Today you're going to be working in the production office. Today you're going to be working with the lighting people. And so you'll get a lot of exposure to different uh, departments and you'll see, you know, what really kind of uh, you spark to. Definitely. And I have like a quick game that maybe we can play before we end today. And it's so basically I have five words. I had to count for a second. And I'm going to ask you um, each of those five words. And you're going to think of a word that po that pops into your mind or an experience um, about that word. Uh, like that as soon as it pops in, like the first. Okay. Word. All right, ready? I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> so the first word is sunsets. Uh, beautiful. Ice cream. Can't get enough. <laughs> <laughs> Dogs. Dogs, my heart. <laughs> Pineapple. Not on pizza. <laughs> Happiness. Happiness is, is life. And that's my, oh, my, I'll have one more. There we go. Beach. Beach? Mm -hmm. Uh, no sharks. 
Yeah, I don't. We go to we used to go to Cape Cod, um, or we still do, but we didn't go this year. And Chatham is like infested with sharks everywhere. Have you seen the movie Jaws? Yeah, I have. You'll never want to go in the water after that. It, it literally changed swimming in the ocean, I think, for everybody because of that underwater shot from the shark's point of view and her legs going like this. Forget it. Uh, whenever I go in the water now, all I can think of is the shark looking at looking up at me. I know. Like I literally like I can't I don't even get because especially with Chatham, the big problem is first of all, there is a bunch of sharks there. And they're close, right? They're they get like really close is the huge problem. Like I think someone spotted one once and was like three feet away from shore. Oh my god. Oh my gosh, that's so close. I know. I wonder why they come so close. I I know that um we're it take I think pretty sure Josh takes place in like Martha's Vineyard. It, yeah, yeah, place. uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, really close to um Cape Cod too, or um, so it's probably I don't know some 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 reason why they like to stay there. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's warm, or I don't know. Maybe they know like all the people are there for something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was so fun. You're really intelligent. I think the questions you asked are are very insightful. I think you got a great thing going what so what are what kind of do you have any idea what you want to do when you get older so I love like I love this um sort of like in the acting business and like the business and stuff um I'm kind of not really sure exactly what I want to do um I love acting um ever since I was little I always loved movies and tv shows and like kind of talking about them with my dad which is how I kind of got into this mm -hmm. but I just love acting in front of the camera and writing stuff sometimes so i'm not exactly sure exactly where i want to be yet but i i love i think somewhere in between there well it was great talking to you and um have a great rest of your day thank you it was so much fun talking to you you too all right take care bye bye thank you so much miss learoff for taking the time to talk it was so interesting to hear about your experiences with casting and now before we searched up Here's a quick fun fact. E.T. loves Reese's Pieces. The company that produced the movie was originally going to have E.T. snack on M&M's, but the Mars company turned down the opportunity. So the producers went to Hershey's and decided to use Reese's Pieces for E.T. And now it's time to search it up. Let's see. Oh, Marcy Learoff was also the casting director on Freaky Friday. So next time, we're going to be talking about Freaky Friday. See you then!